They were all loyal to their boss, Father. as evidenced by this rare interview with killer for hire, Lawrence Newman, a key cog in Spilatro's machine. Are you acquainted with Mr. Spilatro? Very slightly. Never, uh, our meetings were all chance meetings in a restaurant, uh, in a bar, something like that. Nothing was ever planned like a social meeting or anything. I've never had any discussion with the man about anything criminal. Always just social talk. And if he's involved, it's a, it would be uh, news to me because I have no knowledge of it. You have not, in other words, never worked for Mr. Spilatro or anything like that? No way, shape, or form. These two individuals were uh, cold-blooded killers, especially Larry Newman. He's a Jewish lad. Stood about six foot two. I met him in state prison, Stateville Penitentiary. Larry was doing 125 years for a triple murder. He killed two guys and a woman over $2.50. He only did it 11 years on a 125-year sentence because in Chicago, money talks and bullshit walks. His father was able to reach the parole board. Larry made the, his parole in 11 years, as I said. We both worked on a job. The assignment was called Detention Hospital. It was for the criminally insane. So here we are. I meet this guy. He works for the psychiatrist who had to talk to all these criminally insane criminals, very dangerous people up there. And I was a nurse, and so was uh, a couple of There were six of us total. And our jobs were to restrain these nuts whenever they went off and they usually go off every day, and tie him up with restraints and beds. But this is how I found out about Larry being a psychopath. This is a man that had an IQ of 169. He used to do a 1,000 sit-ups a day. I'm not exaggerating. Very, very big man, very intelligent, but loved to kill. And once a week he would kill a an inmate, and usually the inmate he killed up there in the detention hospital was somebody that was locked up for child molestation, something to do with raping or something, that, you know, um, a moron, he would kill him. And he would use their eyeglasses to do it, their own eyeglasses, he'd cut their wrists, their throats, and then uh, we just put him in a bag, wrap him up in paper, put him in a wicker bag, basket, and ship him down the elevator. And nobody ever said anything about it. It was just another guy who committed suicide. Now, Larry used to do this. And every, I worked the graveyard. So every time I come out, I'd see a basket in the corner, and I'd pick up the lid to see if there was somebody in there, because I didn't know who Larry killed the day before. And... Uh, it used to be at least once a week. So now this is how I met Larry Newman. So he looked me up when I had my disco, Spanky's. And he told me, I know you're moving to Vegas. I heard you're moving to Vegas. Could I come out there and work for you? So this is how I got Larry Newman to come to Las Vegas. I contacted him when I got back to Chicago. I says, I got a score for you in Chicago. The guy's got $125,000 worth of jewelry, our money. I says, it's just a plain, simple arm robbery. I'm going to introduce you to a guy by the name of Wayne Matecki. Wayne Matecki was fifth degree black belt. He used to work for me in my disco. He was a bouncer. A very loyal, loyal guy. So I introduced the two guys together. They were supposed to, and I'm living in Vegas now. Now, mind you, this was supposed to be a simple, strong arm robbery. They didn't even need a gun. They went into this guy's business, and Larry decided to kill the guy. 
He had no gun at him, so he wound up strangling him with a hanger. Wayne broke a, vi a vase on the guy's head, opened up the guy's head. Then Larry seen a, a machete, a, well, the bayonet, I'm sorry, it was a bayonet, on the wall as a sol souvenir or whatever they put on the wall. And he proceeded to kill the guy with the bayonet. I didn't know this was happening. He comes to Las Vegas. Wayne didn't come at this time. He comes to Vegas and he says, I got it, went down all right. One glitch. And I looked over at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I had to kill him. I said, why? And he said, because I didn't want him to identify me. I knew that, as you told me previously, that this guy was being funded through Ellen Dorfman. Dorfman was the Teamsters Pension Fund president. This is the money we used to use for the casinos that we controlled in Vegas. And I said, oh, man. I said, you know, you just fucked up big time. I said, they ever find out that we done this, we're all dead. Instantly. I can't sell this stuff to Tony. I can't even show it to him. I said, I'm going to have to bring it and, uh, to California or Arizona. He said, well, you're not going to say anything. I said, no, I'm not going to say nothing to him. But you could have avoided that murder. That was unnecessary, unnecessary. And uh, I did sell the stuff. And uh, we made, between the three of us, 20000 apiece. a uh, piece. That's more than usual. Usually, you, know, you wouldn't get that much. But we made 20000 apiece, a piece. And it took a guy's life, which I was totally against. So that's one of the guys I became... He became involved with us and the hole in the wall gang. He didn't need to steal, Larry. When his father died, his father left him over 800000 in cash and put it in a trust fund. Larry used to get, I think it was anywhere between eight and 10000 every three months, a check. Guy didn't need to steal, he didn't need to kill. And he was very tight with it, he was very frugal. When he got tissues like you buy to clean, you know, he'd wring them out. That's how cheap he was. But that was Larry. I eventually testified on him about that killing and he got him natural life in the Stateville Penitentiary. He did die in the penitentiary and he requested his hamaka. That's that little cap them juice put on their heads. And he's buried in Pottersville in Stateville. Penitentiary, Joliet, Illinois. If you want to go see his tombstone, it's still there. Nobody's reclaimed his body. But then, six Palacho gang members were busted for a series of burglaries, the so-called hole-in-the-wall gang capers. Facing life in prison, another mob killer, Frank Collada, turned government witness. He implicated his boss, Palacho, in a host of crimes, including the 1978 murder of Sherwin Listener. Collada said that he had been ordered by Spalatro to kill Listener because Listener had turned informant. Collada described the night of the murder with chilling dispassion. And I shot him almost by the ear or back of the head. Uh, what happened when you first shot him? He turned around and looked at me and screamed, what are you doing? And I shot him again in the head. Collada was in court yesterday. He is under very heavy, <clears throat> heavy uh, protection, as much as you find as the President of the United States. What about the stories that there's a $200,000 contract, mob contract, on Frank Collada? They're laughing at him. They're laughing at the FBI and the uh, Metropolitan Police at, uh, in Las Vegas. They've given this guy immunity for everything, two murders. Immunity for two murders, and uh, like I say, he was gonna, he was gonna reveal everything against everybody. He can't. He doesn't know anything. They bought a pig in the poke. The man is useless to him, other than trying to get me to cooperate what he's got to say. His lies. 
But despite Larry Newman's protestations, his pal Tony Spilatro by 1983 was facing three separate racketeering indictments, including one RICO charge related to the listener murder. But it was the Argent Skim case in Kansas City that would prove Tony's undoing.